Thank you, uh, Krista, for this uh, kind introduction. Uh, yeah, I hope uh, I will be able uh, to uh, keep you uh, awake after this uh, long but very informative and very uh, enlightening uh, first day of this uh, wonderful uh, workshop organized by, uh, by, by the people here in Vienna. And I'm um, very grateful to be uh, to have been invited to this um, uh, occasion here. Um, although I've been studying Ayurveda for a couple of years, I would say that Ayurveda is uh, still a mystery for me in many respects. But uh, mainly uh, when it comes to um, the question um, of uh, where to position Ayurveda in the religious and intellectual history uh, of uh, South Asia. So what we have are fully fledged um, compendia written in Sanskrit um, from maybe um, uh, the first century of the Common Era onwards, and uh, we have virtually no, no predecessors uh, of these uh, of these texts. There are, uh, of course, um, texts dealing with um, medical questions, but uh, we have nothing that would be comparable, uh, actually, to to what we find in, in these uh, sanitas. And. Uh, the history of uh, Indological research um, on, on Ayurveda uh, reflects this uh, uncertain uh, state and uh, it can be developed in, into three major phases. Uh, the initial phase uh, the initial phase of scholarship that can be uh, yeah, started um, around 1901 with the publication of uh, Julius Jolly's famous work Medicine. Uh, that extended uh, to the publication of uh, uh, Jean Friuzal, the classical doctrine of Indian uh, medicine, its origin and its Greek parallels, that was first published in English translation in 1964. In this phase, Ayurveda was seen as having been developed from Vedic medicine and as being closely affiliated with uh, Vedic Brahmanism. Priyuza summarized the result of his research on the relationship between Ayurveda and Vedic Brahmanism as follows, and I quote, Indian medicine has therefore drawn on the Veda even for the principal elements of its general doctrines. Thereby, Ayurveda is the legitimate hire to the Veda, but it has developed to a large extent the patrimony thus received, end of quote. So Fiyuzar basically saw Ayurveda as a continuation and further development of uh, Vedic medicine. And this uh, um, view was uh, seriously challenged or uh, uh, overcome um, by uh, two works of uh, Kenneth Disk. Um, he uh, wrote, um, um, yeah, as I told you, two books. first one was entitled uh, Religious Healing in the Veda. And uh, this describes the theoretical foundation of uh, Vedic medicine, for which his main source was the Atava Veda Samhita, in the following way. He says, causes of diseases are not attributed to physiological functions, but rather to external beings or forces of a demonic nature, who enter uh, the body of the victim and produce sickness. The removal of such uh, malevolent entities usually involves an elaborated ritual. So, uh, this term this kind of medicine um, as a magical religious healing. And then uh, uh, this continues his, uh, continued his research and uh, published a second monograph on the early history of medicine in India entitled um, Asceticism and Healing in Ancient India, Medicine in the Buddhist Monastery. This highlighted the basic medical conceptions and methods of medical treatment that uh, figure prominently in Ayurveda do not at all occur in Vedic or other Brahmanic sources. And he identified medical conceptions and methods that can actually be found in the literature of early Buddhism as the missing link in the development of Ayurveda. The general attitude towards healing in the sources are based on theories similarly, similar to those of Ayurveda, and uh, these differ considerably from that of uh, Vedic medicine. According to this, the Buddhist and other shamanas emphasized direct observation, systematized the quiet data, and analyzed them in a rational way. 
Uh, this led to the development of theories about the nature of health and the causes of disease. Accordingly, this termed the, termed the medicine of the Buddhists and other shamanas as empirical rational. And he contrasted this basic approach sharply to the magical, uh, magical religious approach of uh, Vedic medicine. So we have two tanks on two different uh, um, forms of uh, medicine. Uh, ten years ago, in 2007, um, Johannes Brankost published his book Great Magada, in which he argued that the cultural and religious history of the Vedic and early classical South Asia was dominated by the intellectual interaction of two re religious complexes. These uh, complexes were in their early, early history largely independent uh, of each other. One of these complexes is, according to Brankost, uh, Vedic Brahmanism. And the second cultural and religious complex comprises the Shamana cultures that originated in the region of Greater Magadha. Uh, at the time of the second urbanization in South um, Asia, around 500 BC. Jainism and Buddhism developed in this cultural setting. These religions, um, religions are based on worldviews that are markedly different from the worldview of Vedic Brahmanism. Significant shared cultural and religious characteristics of the culture of Greater Magadha were, according to Bronkos, the belief in the theory of karma and rebirth, a unique funeral practice around sepulchral mounds, the belief in psychic time, and the empirical, rational medicine of Buddhism and uh, Ayurveda. Um, in presenting the empirical, rational medicine as a characteristic of the culture of Greater Magadha, Bronkos draws almost exclusively on the just mentioned works of this. Bonkos did not, however, um, survey, survey early Ayurvedic works with the question of in how far the cultural and religious affiliations that are reflected in the sources actually support this hypothesis that Ayurvedic medicine originated in the culture of uh, Greater Magadha. In the present talk, uh, I would like to address this question um, by investigating the religious and philosophical affiliation of early classical um, Ayurvedic practitioners. For this, I shall draw on the testimony of the Charaka Sanita, that is the reduction of the Agni Vesha Tantra, that in its oldest strata can be dated with some confidence, as I already mentioned, to the first century of the Common Era. And for this, I will uh, try a little uh, experiment. Um, I will um, invite you to participate in a, in a guided uh, reading of a, of a short uh, Sanskrit passage uh, in translation, of course. Um, that is uh, um, an origin myth um, on uh, the origin of Asayana that occurs uh, in the beginning of the uh, uh, Chikitsa of the Chai Asangita. And in this myth, I think we can uh, find a lot of material um, uh, concerning uh, the worldview and religious uh, um, um, beliefs of the practitioners uh, of, uh, of early Ayurveda, and we can, uh, in, in this way, draw uh, maybe some preliminary conclusions of where these people came from, how they wanted to be seen, uh, and then uh, maybe ask uh, in the final analysis uh, um, whether. Um, this uh, account justifies uh, uh, the tagging of, uh, of the Ayurvedic worldview as an empirical, rational, or magical, or religious, or whether we maybe have to uh, um, revise these categories um, that uh, have been suggested by uh, by Bronkos and this. So, um, yes, I will start now um, uh, reading through this passage. I hope it is uh, big enough. Um, so the passage uh, starts with um, yeah, kind of authentication of, of the whole account. The Venerable Treya, this is uh, uh, the, the basic preceptor, the, the teacher uh, um, of uh, the Charaka Sankhita. He said, now from there on I shall proclaim the chapter on Rasayana entitled The Recovery of uh, Ayurveda. And that's interesting that uh, yeah, Ayurveda uh, needs uh, to be uh, recovered. So, and, and this uh, yeah, story continues then, um, it, it, it starts as, a, as an uh, account. Uh, the Rishis lived sometimes as householders and sometimes they led an itinerary life. 
So we have a situation that uh, um, yeah, the Rishis practice a mixed lifestyle. Um, this uh, itinerary life uh, would correspond uh, to the uh, uh, religion of shramanas, uh, uh, ascetics, homeless ascetics. And on the other hand, we have um, uh, householders that was, would correspond uh, to a lifestyle of Vedic uh, uh, Brahmanas. In general, they consumed village herbs, lived a life of luxury, had become very and were not uh, very healthy. So this uh, account uh, sounds quite neutral, uh, but in the end uh, it already uh, tells us uh, that something had become fundamentally wrong for the Rishis. Uh, they had lost uh, their uh, natural health. They had become very and were not uh, very healthy. Uh, when the great Rishis, Brigu, Angiras, Atri, Vasishta, Kashapa, Agastya, Pulastya, Vamadiva, Asita, Gautama and so uh, on, were unable to perform all their duties properly, they realized that they themselves had committed the fault of living in villages. So this is interesting, we have here a list of, uh, of, of well-known um, Rishis, people that uh, are uh, connected uh, with um, Vedic mythology, Brigo and Angiras, uh, uh, these uh, people uh, appear to be uh, closely connected uh, uh, to the uh, composition of, uh, of the Rig Veda. Also the uh, other uh, Rishis uh, are well known and they especially appear at the very beginning of the Charaka Sangita in the uh, original myth that uh, is uh, narrated in the beginning of the Sutra Sana uh, as members of a group uh, of Rishis who uh, uh, had originally received um, Ayurvedic uh, teaching from um, uh, from uh, about uh, Indra, um, but by means of uh, human intervention. So then they went to their. Um, so yeah, um, th this uh, Rishis had uh, become unable to perform all their duties properly. That means they could not practice medicine anymore. And then they realized that they mis themselves had committed uh, the fault of living in villages. So they had given up their uh, original lifestyle, uh, which would have been uh, that of wandering ascetics. Then they went to their previous home, which was uh, free from rural defects, to the fortunate, meritorious, and great Himalaya, the perfect refuge, which is suitable for sac sacrifices, impenetrable for people of bad conduct to the source of the Ganges, attended by gods, heavenly musicians and singers, to the storehouse of countless gems, which is filled with unimaginable and marvelous beauty, attended by Brahma Rishis, accomplished saints and celestial <coughs> singers, where herbs grow at heavenly places of pilgrimage, protected by uh, the Lord of Gods. So this, this account is uh, quite remarkable because it praises uh, the, the Himalaya as a, as a very special place uh, uh, connected uh, with, with uh, the uh, um, uh, Ayurvedic practice. And I think uh, there are any um, half of any other uh, earlier sources in which the Himalaya would uh, appear as uh, such an uh, extraordinary uh, place uh, of uh, uh, yeah, so, so many, uh, uh, with so many uh, positive uh, qualifications. So if we remember, Vedic Brahmanism uh, is located uh, uh, in, in a region that uh, uh, was, was uh, uh, called Aryabhata, that is uh, the region uh, in uh, northwestern India, and um, on the other hand, uh, the uh, Shramana religions from Greater Magadha, um, they had their uh, origin uh, in the eastern uh, Ganges uh, basin, and in the region of the uh, Mahajanapadas. So none of these uh, cultural uh, settings has any special relationship uh, to the Himalaya, and I find this uh, uh, quite uh, remarkable. Um, the, the Himalaya is um, yeah, described uh, uh, um, as suitable for sacrifices. This is also quite uh, a, re a remarkable in my uh, view. So as media, yeah, usually the place where sacrifices uh, should uh, uh, take place and where they are most effective uh, would have been uh, the home of the Aryas, that is uh, Arya and not uh, uh, the Himalaya, which uh, extends uh, the limits of uh, Arya Aryabhata. So th then we have uh, yeah, different uh, uh, religious um, conceptions reflected in this passage. Of course, the sacrifices are mentioned. Then this region is impenetrable for people of bad conduct, which uh, may, be, may relate uh, to a theory of, of karma. 
Uh, and then uh, we, we have um, um, uh, information about uh, a religious phenomena, which is also quite new at that time, namely uh, the phenomenon of uh, uh, pilgrimage, places of pilgrimages uh, that uh, should be uh, located in the Himalaya. Yeah? So uh, we see here um, a description with a whole mixture of uh, religious ideas, some of uh, which can be uh, related uh, to uh, the Vedic Brahmanism, some of which could be related to the um, um, uh, Shramana religions of Veta Magadha, but we also have a good um, amount of, of new ideas uh, that we don't find in uh, earlier sources. To them Indra spoke, the god with thousand eyes, the teacher of the gods, welcome to you Brahma Vishis. You know the Brahma, you know the Brahman and are rich in knowledge and asceticism. You are not, are you not tired, weak, voiceless and pale, which is uncomfortable and leads to uncomfortable final consequences because you lived in the village? Living in the village is known to be the root of all evil. Now this is quite interesting. Yeah? Um, this account does not mention any cities yeah, uh, um, that would have been known to ascetics of the region of Greater Magadha, but it mentions villages. Uh, so that it makes me uh, wonder what, whether one can, one can maintain that uh, Ayurveda uh, developed out of, um, uh, directly out of the uh, Shramana religions of uh, Greater Magadha. Since you, the rishis, who act meritoriously, have done this as an act of favor for the living beings, the time has come for you to care for your own bodies, and the time has come for me to teach Ayurveda to you, uh, to you Brahma rishis. So the rishis have done something wrong, they lived in villages, but uh, mm, this um, mm, mistake that they did uh, was done out of a positive motivation. So there is no need for, for, for Indra to punish the, the rishis, but he sees that uh, um, the, the rishis did this um, as uh, um, an act of favor for all living beings. Now that is also an idea that we find uh, frequently uh, in um, uh, Shramana religions, especially in Buddhism, that it's good uh, to favor the living beings. And uh, this is also something that is uh, very um, prominent uh, in, in Ayurveda. Um, then, then we have an uh, account uh, of uh, how Ayurveda came to, uh, to humankind. Yeah, the Ashwins passed down Ayurveda to me in order to favor myself as well as the living beings in the same way as Prajapati had done it to the Ashwins and Brahma to Prajapati. So uh, this is uh, a repetition of the uh, origin myth of uh, Ayurveda that we, have, uh, uh, that we find at the beginning of the uh, Sutra Stana. Yeah, and then it continues, living beings only have a short life full of old age and disease. This is uncomfortable and leads to uncomfortable final consequences. Since life is short, little is the amount of asceticism, religious commitments and observances that can be practiced. Few gifts can be provided and little can be studied. So this is a, a set of, of practices that is very um, um, directly um, connected to ascetic movements, asceticism is mentioned uh, itself. Then we have uh, Dhamma and Yama, religious commitments and observances. And then we have, uh, yeah, obviously, uh, allusion to Kamari, Kama theory, that it's uh, meritorious to give uh, uh, away uh, gifts. And yeah, finally, little can be studied. This, of course, is a reference to uh, Ayurveda uh, itself. Realize this you are entitled in order to favor living beings to hear from me, to comprehend and to disseminate what is highly meritorious, extends the lifespan, cures old age and disease, provides strength, is imperishable, fortunate, protective and illustrious, and what is a sacred text, Brahma, appropriate for wishes, related to the benevolence and compassion as well as to your own, high, own highest merit, to the illustrious, imperishable, medical action derived from Brahma, karma. And so I would take this, this word karma here in a, in a double meaning. It uh, uh, on the one hand uh, refers uh, of course to uh, medical practice, but on the other hand it can also have this religious connotation uh, uh, of uh, a meritorious action in a religious sense. And it may be, um, yeah, maybe a little bit uh, speculative, but I don't think it's uh, highly unlikely 
that Ayurveda itself um, made a contribution um, to, to a new uh, idea of karma theories, namely that uh, uh, worldly actions as uh, uh, treating uh, patients uh, can be a meritorious act that, that leads to rebirth uh, in, in heaven um, after the uh, death of um, the Ayurveda, uh, Ayurvedic British, um, practitioner. After they had heard this speech of the Lord of the Gods, they all praised the best of the immortals with Rigvedic verses, were exceedingly delighted and applauded to his speech. So here we have, of course, a very clear reference to the, the Vedic religion, so the, um, Ayur, um, the Rishis, they praised uh, Indra with uh, Rig Vedic uh, verses. So now uh, coming to a conclusion, just uh, one, uh, one more minute, I would say that this uh, account shows that we have a unique mixture of uh, religious ideas that we do not find uh, before and that would uh, justify the assumption that Ayurvedic practitioners at that time had a unique um, um, religious identity that cannot be directly related uh, to Vedic Brahmanism and that can also not be related uh, directly to the religions of Vedic Thank you. So, do you think that this is an indication of Rasayana being its own tantra, its own discipline, a separate thing from the other things, the other parts of medicine? Uh, I think the, the fact that we have a second origination myth at the beginning of the Chikitsa Stana shows a process of assimilation of something that uh, maybe was kind of foreign to Ayurveda, although we, of course we have the uh, Rasayana is one of the eight uh, branches of Ayurveda. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not entirely sure about this, but I think that is at least a possibility that one should, uh, should keep in mind. Yeah? And uh, I also find that, um, uh, the title of the passage interesting, yeah? the recovery of Ayurveda. So we have, so to say, the Rasayana here applied to Ayurveda, so that it becomes uh, again uh, fully fully active uh, and uh, practiced in, in a perfect way by, by, the, by the physicians but uh, yeah I mean it's it's difficult to answer the question uh, that, 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 that you ask yeah? and one, 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 one would have to look for further uh, um, evidences in, in other sources maybe in other parts of the channel. I would like to ask a question. So, uh, um, I'm not sure uh, if you mentioned it, but uh, about the. Are you sure this uh, narrative is contemporary to the uh, chapter uh, on Chikitsa or which uh, follows? I'm just asking that because it reminds me of kind of a, a frame narrative in Pranic literature, for example, and this way to just include different meaning to go and uh, even the, 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 the language itself remind me some uh, pranic style so I'm just asking if that there is any possibility. Yes, uh, as you know the Chanaka Sangita has a complicated uh, uh, history of uh, textual transmission. We have uh, different layers of the original uh, uh, Agni Tantra should have been revised by Chanaka and then the Lilabala form that uh, some fans were missing and composed them themselves. This is not a part uh, of the Charaka Sangita which is said to have been composed by the Riddhavada. So um, I can see no, uh, no, no reason why this uh, should not have been uh, part of the oldest, uh, or oldest atom of, uh, of the Charaka Sangita. Yes. Uh. Thank you very much. Any further uh, questions? Many diseases are involved in this Ayurveda. 
Pan, would you? Yeah. Many diseases are involved in Ayurvedic treatise and uh, they developed so many treatments. So is there a Rishi and a physician's role was together or Rishis have different aspects and the physicians who are working with the community, they are different? So like or the mixed role? Yes, uh, I mean uh, these uh, Rishis are uh, uh, so to say the, the first uh, listeners uh, to the uh, original uh, Ayurveda which was uh, transmitted according to this account uh, from heaven to earth, and some of them are said to have been uh, to have composed uh, their, their own treatises. So I think they are kind of uh, uh, pre-mortal phys physicians who started their own line of, of teaching. So they they, uh, they they obviously were physicians themselves, uh, according to this uh, to this narrative. Yeah, it is said that uh, you committed this fault in order to favor the beings. That is, uh, that means that the. Uh, the rishis were in the villages to treat uh, people with, with uh, Ayurvedic uh, recipes uh, and uh, Ayurvedic treatment, according to this account. So uh, this uh, uh, rishis, yeah, they had been told uh, Ayurveda before. Then they went to the villages, practiced it, uh, came under the ne negative influence of uh, village life, and then they had forgotten uh, uh, maybe uh, what Ayurveda was all about. And then they needed a recovery of Ayurveda, and for that reason they, they went uh, to the Yamalaya and were again instructed by Yamalaya. So that's what this story says. So it means for the Rishis, uh, it is difficult to maintain the household life and the Yamalaya life. A detached life and a test life. So again, a uh, problem. Yes, uh, I mean, th this is the problem that is mentioned here, no? this is where, where it comes uh, from, yeah, so there was conflict, yeah, um, for uh, the professional ethics uh, that, that uh, the Rishis uh, had to, to cope with, you know? in order to treat uh, the uh, suffering beings, they had to go to the villages, maybe they should have left earlier, but I mean, Indra is not angry with them, yeah? he, he simply uh, bestows again, Ayurveda on them, and uh, then uh, yeah, they have it again, and everything is fine. We have a happy ending, they uh, uh, praise him with uh, Rigvedic hymns, and, and that's it. You know? so. And of course, it's not an historical account, yes, it is a myth yeah, uh, that, that wants to, to tell us something about uh, the way that uh, the uh, uh, early Ayurvedic positions viewed themselves. Yeah, and uh, how they wanted to be viewed, but this is of course not a, a, any historical event that is recorded here. So, hi, uh, I was just wondering, so you started off by uh, presenting Ken's binaries of empirical, okay, rational, and uh, magical religious, and you said that you would, this would help us think of whether that's valid or not, so where, where do we stand now? Uh, we can see that uh, religious conceptions are uh, uh, a genuine part of the world view of early Ayurvedic physicians. We don't have a purely empirical, rational method. Yes? This is something that uh, is uh, frequently uh, maintained in secondary literature. Yeah? Uh, and also in the self-representation of Ayurveda today as uh, something yeah, completely rational, but, but that's not the case. Yeah? So. And uh, this idea yeah, of uh, conflicting uh, empirical, rational, and the magical religious would never have appeared to these people, I would say. It's, it's, uh, it comes from the outside, it's a foreign uh, this, uh, um, differentiation that is made here. Well, we have a uh, one last question. I'd just like to uh, comment on the attachment part that you mentioned of the Rishi's old Ayurvedic. Um, physician in the past, I feel like uh, abandoning the uh, yoga, this is my home life, it is the actual practice of the rejuvenation of the children, where there is a caloric restriction, the yogi or the uh, physician uh, give up the kind of a mundane life and then save the kind of a more spiritual life, thereby getting the rasayana or children. 
That, that's of course the, the natural way, as it is also depicted in this myth. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Philip, uh, for this talk. Thank you.